the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger, and he shall be called Emmanuel. God is with us. Amen. Amen. We've been in a series here at Church Alive called God With Us as we've been unpacking really what that means and what that looks like in this season together. But hey, let me, let me ask this question because um, this may be your last ditch effort to let the ones that you love know that you're expecting a little something under the tree. Raise your hand if you're expecting a little something, a little, a little something, maybe it's even a sweet little, come on, some of you, come on. This is your last moment <laughs> nudging that spouse, uh, child or son or daughter, you know, young adult, whatever, nudging that, you know, loved one or that parent there and let them know it's, it's close, it's close. You know, I, it reminds me of a story I heard once of a little boy who, he, uh, the, the parents and, and his older sister were gathered there in the living room and he, he began to just pray really loudly. He was praying and asking God and just praying and giving his list of Christmas wishes to God. And his, he was doing it so loudly, his, little, his older sister leaned down and she began to tell him, she says, hey, little brother, you don't, you don't, have, to, you don't have to pray so loudly. God is not deaf. Little brother looked at big sister and said, big sis, I know God's not deaf, but mama always says dad is. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know if that's true in your household. I, I have to ask, what'd you say? What'd you say? Alone? So he, he was praying so loudly that, so that everyone could hear because he knew. And, you know, I heard this story as well, this little girl who wanted this specific pink bicycle. It was such a high demand item for that season and, and it was flying off a shelf. The parents couldn't find it anywhere. And of course, the little girl over and over and over again would tell the, the mom and dad, this is, what, this is what I want. This is the only thing I want. And of course, because of the demand, it was so expensive. It was very hard to find. Not sure if they were going to be able to do it or not. The parents leaned down to the little girl and they said, little girl, uh, uh, honey, uh, daughter, how about this? Do you think you have just been good enough this year to really, to, to just, to be blessed with such a gift? And of course, the little girl's response back to her parents were, yeah, of course, of course, I've been good enough. I mean, look at me, right? I'm good enough. So the mom gives her something though. She says, here's what I want you to do, honey. I want you to go and I want you to pray and I want you to ask God if this is something that he desires for you to have. And maybe God would, would meet you in this, this desire. Little girl, not sure what to do with that. She decides, to, she decides to go back to her room. She's sitting there on the edge of her bed, a little pouty. And finally she says, you know what? I'll give it a shot. Pulls out a piece of paper. She begins to write on that piece of paper. Dear God, I've been good for three months. Would you bring... She pauses and she crumbles that piece of paper up, throws it away and grabs another sheet of paper and she starts over. Dear God, I've been good for one month. Wads it up, grabs another sheet of paper and then she begins to write. Dear God, I've been good for one whole day. Would you bring me that bicycle? And then she remembers, wait a minute, I remember who I'm writing this letter to. This is to God, he, he knows everything. And so she runs to the living room. Her mom had that nativity set, just nice and 
just po poised on the mantle. She grabs the figurine of Mother Mary and races back to her room, reaches in her sock drawer, wraps the sock around Mother Mary, grabs a piece of paper, and then she begins to write, Dear God, if you ever wanna see your mother again, <laughs> you'll bring me that pink bicycle. Now, I know that none of us in this room believe that that is how we approach God from a wish list, that we approach him in a materialistic way. In fact, I, I believe that ma majority of us, if not all of us gathered here today, that we understand that without Christ, we don't have Christmas. Amen? Amen? And without Emmanuel, which means God with us, there's really no reason for celebration. There's re really no reason to celebrate without the understanding of what that really means in us and for us. Today, as I begin to think about what to share in this message, the Lord drew me back to uh, really something I never would have ever pictured for a Christmas Eve morning uh, candlelight communion. He took me back to the very beginning. And I don't know if you've ever tried to read the Bible. Anybody ever tried to read the Bible all the way through? Where do you usually start? You, you typically, in most books that you read, you start at the beginning, right? Unless you're different, you start at the end and you figure out the ending and, or you're cramming for college and you just read the first and the last sentence of every paragraph, right? <laughs> but he, the Lord took me to the beginning of the book and as I open it, Maybe you've read it multiple times as you've attempted this. And it starts with this in Genesis chapter one, verses one through three. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters. And the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. That was the first thing that he spoke into existence was light. And then he divided the night from the day. He begins to create all these things that we experience and enjoy here on this planet. And then he created humanity. You and I, he made them in his image. Scripture says he breathed life into them. But I, as I was studying the scripture, I was reminded that you and I, we read this most often in our common language, with which perhaps for the majority of us, our most common language is English. And so we're, we, we read this scripture in English. And often we fail to realize that at the very beginning of this book, you see, we often picture God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, that's God's Son, the Holy Spirit, sporadically at different times throughout scripture, just showing up when necessary. But when you open the book, it points back to the very beginning. You see this word God in the beginning, God is we read it in English, but in, in Hebrew is the way it was originally written is the word Elohim. Elohim is the plural form of God. And so the writer is capturing in this moment that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were present right at the very beginning. He didn't just show up on the scene in a, in a manger. The Holy Spirit didn't just show up when, God is, when God, Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, but he was there from the very beginning. And when I, when I was taken back to the scripture, I was reminded as I read those words, the earth was formless, it was empty, it was void of anything, but it was covered in darkness. And Jesus Christ, God's Son, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit were present as the Spirit hovered over the earth. And it says that he declared those words, let there be light. And the picture that I saw when I, heard, when I read those words was that God brought darkness to light. It didn't mean that light didn't exist prior to that moment, as we'll learn in just a few moments, but he brought darkness to light. 
In other words, light, he stepped onto the scene and he began to, to create. He began to create one of the greatest things that he declared was very good, and that was humanity. Of course, we know what happened in, you know, in a chapter or two later as Adam and Eve fall. They're disobedient. But fast forward into the New Testament. Because today we, we, we're here and we're, we're, talking about, we're talking about this moment as Jesus, God's son, made his way into the scene, born of a virgin, lowly, humbly in a manger, not in a palace. The gospel writer named John recorded this and he opened up his gospel, the book that he was inspired to write, not only as an eyewitness of Jesus Christ, but inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words. He says this, and it sounds familiar, in the beginning, he wants you to, the reader, as they read it, to point them back to the very beginning. Not the beginning of his book, not the beginning of the gospel, but the very beginning. In the beginning, the word, capital W. In the Greek, this word is logos. But this word, as you read it, you'll begin to see who he's talking about. He says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God. The word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. Remember John 14, six, Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. He says, God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. He brought us from darkness to light. And I love the gospel of John because John has walked with Jesus. He has seen the miracles that Jesus has performed. He is now aligning these prophecies of the Old Testament, prophesying the coming Messiah and trying to rationalize how he's going to do this. Little did they expect the way he would go about redeeming man back to him. But verse five says this in John one, it says, the light shines in the darkness. This is the part you don't wanna miss. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never, everybody say never, never, never extinguish it. When I begin to study this, I had this weird question that popped up. I'm wondering, is it possible that light could still exist in darkness? And I begin to research it and I actually begin to find that the fact is, is darkness is never absent of light. Now that's hard for us to fathom and hard for us to imagine. I grew up in the country, but even in the middle of the country with all, no street lights, it could be pitch black, but there's always light present. Darkness is never absent. Scientifically, it is not true. It is never absent of light. And I thought this fascinating because as the spirit of God hovered over the earth and darkness covered the earth and he spoke light into existence. It, and then I read John's gospel in the beginning, the, the word already existed and the word gave life. He brought light to everyone and the light shines in the darkness. My mind went to that moment that even at the very beginning, when man who was made in God's image, you and I, he had given them everything they needed. He put everything in place and he put a boundary to protect them from good and evil, to be able to protect them from what he knew existed that we could, could contaminate, that could destroy, that could, could derail their life. And he had a purpose in place for them. But at that moment, they were deceived by the enemy and they surrendered the authority that God gave man to the enemy. God being the all-knowing God that we know the little girl knew, right? The little girl knew that God knew everything he knew already because he had put in place plans. But you see, God gave you and I a free will, just like he gave Adam and Eve a free will. He gave, he gave uh, these individuals free will and we have that same free will to choose and they chose disobedience in that moment. And because of that, it, it, brought, it invited sin and separation from God. God had walked with them in the garden. He, had, he, he would go and read scripture in Genesis three. He, he walked with them. He was there among them. 
And then the enemy came in and this sin brought separation, but God's plan of redemption was set in motion as he would begin to walk through and use a people, a chosen people to be an instrument that would reflect him, that would begin to point people back to him, that would continue to, but he wouldn't just use that. He would send his son, Jesus Christ, that was present all along to truly be the light of the world. You see, I look back in that darkness, in that dark moment, and what I see is that God had a purpose and he still has a purpose for each and every one of us. But in that moment, looking back, as John was pointing back, he was reflecting back to that moment when purpose met pain. When purpose met pain, when purpose met heartache, when, when from the very first time, these individuals would learn what it meant to experience not just life, but death. Not just good health, but sickness. For the very first moment, they would truly begin to experience darkness. But the darkness would never extinguish the light because the plan was in full motion. In John chapter one, verse 14, John goes on to say this. He says, the word became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. So, why do, we, why do we put up the nativity set? Why do we have that manger? Why do we, we, we celebrate this time? Because we understand that the only way for God to redeem his people back to him, he wasn't gonna force them. He wasn't going to uh, mandate anything in their life. He was giving them this opportunity because he wanted them to see that from the very beginning, his purpose was to be with them. His purpose was to be among them. His purpose was to guide them, to lead them to the pleasing, perfect plan and purpose that he had in place. Not to live in pain, not to live in separation or isolation, or not even to, to reside in darkness mentally, emotionally, or physically in their, in their lives. But he wanted to be God with humanity, God with us. Even when he ascended into heaven, he said, I'm gonna send my spirit to reside and to live in you, to guide you. See, he had to come in this way because birth through a virgin woman would make it possible for him to experience the limitations that you and I experience, but would, be, would resemble the likeness of his creation, man. He would be flesh, he would be human. He would be fully human being born of a virgin, but he, being born of a virgin would keep him pure and holy as the lamb of God, the spotless lamb of God that he was but being conceived by the Holy Spirit and not the seed of a sinful man would ensure that what he was coming to do would not be tarnished and that his holiness would not be tarnished in any way to be the loving God that he set out to be, to seek and save that which was lost. That's why he would come in this way because only a spotless, perfect lamb could take our place. But for us to understand that we serve a God who faced the same temptations, faced the same persecutions. In fact, he was betrayed by those closest to him. He was persecuted. He was abandoned by those who were closest to him. One minute they're, they're raising a hallelujah to him. The next minute they're raising a crucify. But this would allow Jesus, God's son, to experience the limitations, the challenges, the temptations, and he would overcome them all without failing to disobey his father. He had every opportunity to call down legions of angels to take him from that cross. He had that same free will that you and I have this morning to choose Christ, to choose his will, to choose his purpose, even while he was in the middle of his pain. Yet he said, God, not my will, but your will. You see, this would allow him to fulfill the purpose, to seek and save that which is lost, his creation. Matthew 1, declares this. We've been using it all along in our series. Matthew is quoting the prophet Isaiah that was 
prophesied this statement over 400 years prior to the moment of Jesus Christ, God's son arrival on the scene. He says this, Isaiah, Matthew quoting him, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Would you say those words, God with us? Because Jesus became one of us. He also could give his life in our place, paying the complete penalty for sin that separates you and I from him. He desires to be close. Today, I pray that if you're experiencing darkness in any form or fashion in your life, that you'll find the light of Christ. Today, I I pray that you'll understand that darkness is never absent of light. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're experiencing, no matter what you're going through, this is not always an easy time for individuals in this room. Some of you have lost loved ones, you've lost friends. And holidays and these times that we we commemorate and come together, it can be difficult. Some of you are separated from family or not able to be with them, but that doesn't always feel good. And it, it brings back joyful memories and often sometimes sad memories. But what we should always remember is that the light of Christ, no matter what we're experiencing in our lives, is present. And that no matter the darkness that you experience in your life, darkness can never extinguish the light of Christ if he lives in you. If you've made him the Lord of your life, if you've said yes to him and you begin to surrender your life to him. I want you to take your communion cups out. They were placed in your seat there as you sat down. And I want you to begin to prepare to open them and just We'll take it together in just a moment. But I wanna reflect on 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the apostle Paul, who was a persecutor of those in the faith. He, he claimed to be a religious person, but these people who were followers of the way, followers of Jesus, disciples of him were radical to him. And so he, was even among the first martyr, Stephen, in in the Bible. See, scripture notes that he was there standing by and holding the coats of those who were stoning the first martyr of the church. But he has a radical conversion experience where he meets Jesus on a road to Damascus, going to perhaps persecute or imprison followers of Jesus. A bright shining light blinds him. And he begins a relationship with the true one, the Messiah. And he records this in 1 Corinthians 11. And he's reflecting back in, as as I read this, he's reflecting back to this, what we call the last supper or the, 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 the living Lord's supper, where Jesus sits around with his followers in an upper room and he begins to break bread and drink wine among them. And he is, begins to point them towards something. He's been pointing them all along, but now it is the night before he is betrayed. And he's pointing them to this moment that guys, what you're about to witness is painful. What you're about to see, my body that is broken, my blood that is shed. They're like thinking probably what, what is he talking about? They understand the prophecies, but they're not rationalizing it like he is about to experience. There is much pain ahead of him. In fact, scripture defines that pain as he's in the garden of Gethsemane. He's praying there and pleading and and he's saying, God, Lord, uh, Lord, God, if if it's, if you could, if this cup, it could just pass from me, God, but it, but if your will, not my will, God. And he's even praying so intensely and so passionately that scripture records that, that even his, his capillaries begin to to burst as sweats falling down. And and it, it seemed like drops of blood that would fall from his brows he's praying and interceding because he is experiencing the most intense pain. And even as he was stretched upon that cross, the most gruesome moment for him, the most heaviest, darkest moment for him was when the sin of humanity was placed upon him. And at that moment is when his father had to turn away, had to separate himself from him. 
and allow his son to become the one who would redeem you and I back, to give us that opportunity to say, God, with me. God, with me. Not just on this side of heaven, but after this life in eternity with him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord, but I also pass on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. He took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whatever, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Would you bow your heads with me right now? If you're in this room this morning and you don't know the Lord as your personal savior, every one of us who, who have said yes to the Lord and we've invited the Lord to, be able to, 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 to lead us and to guide us and to forgive us of our shortcomings and our sins, we've all had this moment, but today is a very special day. This is Christmas Eve morning, the time that we celebrate that, that, that the coming of our Lord and Savior. And this is a great moment for you. If you don't know the Lord as your personal savior to say, God, I wanna begin that relationship with you. I wanna, I, I'm experiencing, it's darkness and I've, I've done it all alone, but now I want to invite you into, into my heart. I want to make you the Lord of my life. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that he is Lord and, and, and you believe in your heart and you ask God to say, you come in to, to cleanse you, to, to heal you, to bring light to your life, that he will save you. He will rescue you for that is what he came to do all along is to seek and save that which was lost. And I was lost without him. I have no hope. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Jimmy, pray for me. I'm not gonna call you up. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm just gonna pray for you. If you're here and you say, Pastor Jimmy, pray for me. Would you just raise your hand up and just wave it at me high and we'll, we'll pray today. Anyone at all? Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, I see that little hand. Thank you. I encourage you right now, if you raise your hand, no matter your age, in this room, I saw young, very young, and I saw uh, 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 seasoned individuals, God, who love you with their heart. God, they're acknowledging you right now. And God, I pray right now that you will bless them, you will help them, Lord. And if you raise your hand, I pray that, they, that you will, Lord, use your words and use your mouth to take this moment before you receive this communion and say, God, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins because these elements that you're about to receive into, into your body represent his broken body and the blood that he shed that is cleansing you and bringing healing over your life and hope in you as we look forward to whatever is ahead. Lord, I thank you and I praise you, God. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, as we go today, I pray, God, for blessings upon every person in this house, for those watching online today, God, those who are unable to be here today, even from sickness or those from distance, God, that has kept them away. I pray, God, blessings upon each and every family. And I pray that you will keep, uh, protect us, guide us, use us in this season to be those who carry your light wherever we go to help others who are experiencing darkness. Be reminded of who you are. You are God with us, Emmanuel, Jesus.